Welcome to WebRTC Live. In WebRTC Live, we cover the latest technical topics and business use cases for WebRTC and live video. As always, this episode is brought to you by WebRTC Ventures, leading integrators of WebRTC video into your custom application. Welcome back to WebRTC Live. I'm your host, Aaron Syme, founder and CEO of WebRTC Ventures. WebRTC Ventures is a custom design and development agency focused on building live video applications. We're here to help you take your application live. You can learn more about us at webrtc.ventures. Thanks for joining us live today on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitch, and welcome also to any of you watching a replay of today's event. For those of you with us live, you can ask questions throughout the stream by leaving a comment in whichever platform you're viewing this. For today's episode, I'm joined by Paola Osas. Paola is an AI engineer at Numena, where she specializes in developing cutting edge deep learning and computer vision algorithms. Numena is dedicated to creating tools and metrics that enable decision makers to develop more efficient, resilient, and sustainable spatial solutions. Paola's work at Numena involves developing computer vision algorithms for different company projects, mainly focusing on object detection, segmentation, and tracking. Additionally, she leads the Spanish team for the EU-funded project Icarus, which explores the use of drones in agriculture, forestry, and rural communities. Paola is joining us today from Barcelona to talk about how computer vision is changing the game for video data analytics. Thanks for joining me today, Paola. Hello, I'm very glad to be here. Oh, it's wonderful to have you. Uh, so let's uh, let's start with talking a little bit about the ComCon conference where you were at recently uh, and gave a presentation on the same topic there. Uh, what was your experience like at the conference? Uh, did you have any favorite presentations there? Yeah, I think it was an amazing experience. It's like a very nice um, conference. They do a lot of activities, so you kind of meet everybody. So you're like doing networking, but it's like easy to talk to people. And all the conferences were very good. I think they started with Jeff Polver, which did an, ama an amazing um, presentation, which um, felt like you were like, you know, when you hear someone talking and then you're like, you're like more happy after that. <laughs> so it had that feeling, it's like the, the best way to start the conference. And then there were so amazing topics. There were a lot of AI, which I was um, not expecting. But before me, there was, um, it was talking Rob Pickering, I think who explained, he did a use case on how you can use large language models to assist, uh, for instance, um, your commerce. So he created some software that you were able to um, speak to it, that you will call a company and then an AI machine will answer. And so he basically explained how, to, you, how you do you have to do the prompt um, to prepare this assistant. And he did a live demo, which was very nice as well. And nice. I think, yeah, I think it was very, very nice experience. Yeah, I've only ever heard good things about the ComCon conference for sure, both the event and the speakers. Uh, and um, yeah, the presentation you you were just speaking about the you know conversational AI and and having voice or text chat bots uh, in sort of customer context centers certainly a very interesting application of AI and one that we're working with a lot in our work uh, at Weber TC Ventures and building live video application tools. But there's a lot more to AI, of course, yeah. uh, and a lot more to how AI can be used with computer vision. And so that's why I'm really interested to talk with you today. Your, your subject matter expertise is not necessarily around doing this in the Weber TC space, or at least not in the sort of use cases we're used to working in. So I'm really interested to kind of hear more from you about that and uh, you know, uh, talk a little bit about ways we could use that uh, in, in the sort of use cases we work in. But let's start with, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background and how you got into AI and computer vision? Okay, so I studied audiovisual systems engineering at a university here in Barcelona that is called Pompeu Fabra. And we, th we had one subject that was machine learning, which I loved. And then the professor talked to me and asked if I wanted to join a, pro a project that was being developed in a hospital, where a very import uh, important hospital here in Barcelona that is called Videbron. And the objective of this uh, project was to detect um, kidney diseases through image, because um, it's very hard to detect it because you need a lot of years of experience. So the idea was to simulate the experience of a surgeon 
with the AI. So we were using a lot of images that the surgeons were sending to us. And from that, we wanted to detect if the mm -hmm. kidney was good or not, and eventually be able to use this tool to identify these kidneys so we can do like transplants or maybe we cannot use this kidney. And so I started with that and I loved it. So then I continued this path and I started working here in Nomena, where here is more focused with, I always work with images and then now here I started working with video, which I think it gives you more opportunities because you can, like you can expect more meaningful data. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it, basically we do a lot of object detection, cementation, all that you have to, that you can do with images and AI, I think we cover, which is very nice. Yeah. It, it, talk with us a little bit more about that, uh, how difficult a leap that is to make from using ML AI with a like static image or even a set of static images versus a video. So the thing is that like you have differences mostly when you extract the data on how you extract the meaning because in an image is kind of straightforward so you can see like this is a person and you can detect this from an image because all of the object detection models if you're only doing object detection at the end the video is just a set of frames that are images mm -hmm. so you could like you are doing this um, segmentation for each image and then you can like um, join all of them but with the video, you have the, the opportunity to also understand some moments. For instance, if you do pose estimation in an image, you just have like one pose. So from that, you get what you want. But in a video, you can understand how the people are interacting between them, for instance. So they, if they are close to each other, you could imagine that they are talking. Or maybe if you're on a big event and you kind of see when people are sitting and if they stay together, you can say, okay, this is a group of friends or this is a, I don't know, um, or they are not friends because every time that they are together, they go apart. Or even you could detect like uh, in the company we use it for retail as well so we kind of understand from video how you're able to interact with the spaces in the stores and um, so I don't, if you are picking up a shoe for instance because we're able to see it and um, i think this is more of the part but a lot of the things like there are things that you can apply both to image and video but then for instance tracking you can only do it for video right uh, you're following the persons and everything I'm curious in a use case like you were doing with uh, detecting kidney disease from images. Um, thankfully, I don't know anything about kidney disease, but I'm imagining situations of seeing like x-rays being, uh, you know, if you're in the doctor's office and you're watching or like an ultrasound type of scenario where perhaps you're watching the the medical professional sort of move the, the, the wand around and, and seeing ultrasound images on the screen, the image changes so much in like with just a slight motion of the, the the wand of the detector or or even kind of sitting still like do you in in those sorts of situations are you working with like a single static image of the kidney or do you work with kind of a set and you're looking for do i see this this blemish this spot in all the images like how do you in a scenario like that how do you even know if this is a um, like a real spot that i'm seeing that's actually there or something that's maybe uh, something about the detection itself and inaccuracy that just showed up in that one single frame. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the thing for us in our case, we had multiple images. So mm -hmm. then we started using RGB images, which was most of what I used because the doctors were able to just um, do it, not normal traditional images and um, with RGB. But um, in these cases, when normally what you do, you can even create a 3D model. So you have all the, like you could even have a video or you have all the, all the images that surround the kidney and you can create a 3D model. And from that, um, bueno, I always use the Python. So with that, you have some libraries that you can able, you are able to, from a point cloud, so a 3D point cloud, you're able to detect the colors of the points and then create clusters. So maybe if the points are like from a specific color and they are all together, this will mean that this is a possibility of a disease. And then from that, so depending on the history, you would be able to be more um, specific on what disease or maybe just like a bad image and you have some blurry movements, but. Right. Yeah. Right, absolutely. Interesting. Uh, the uh, presentation that you did at CompCon was about your team's work in Barcelona using yeah. AI for traffic monitoring and analysis. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, yeah, so it was an amazing project because here in Barcelona, we are having like a changing of the spatial dynamics of the city. And um, so for so I've been, I think from the last five or 10 years, we are changing some of the streets so people are starting to interact with the city in a different way. So there is a big project that is called Superilla, 
Yeah, which uh, that I think there is no translation because it's not like that big <laughs> at the moment, <laughs> but it will be like big Iceland because there is a part of Barcelona that we have like all the squares. So it is like a grid and we have um, the streets and then the houses. But um, this time we are changing and we are putting one of the streets that is just designed to have the cars and the pedestrians. In the future, it will be just pedestrians. Well, actually now uh, they just finished the construction. So now it's just for pedestrians. And so it was very interesting because in, here in the office we have... Um, we had this project which basically was to monitor how this street is being used now and the streets that are um, close to it. So you know how you know how the people are interacting with it. And now that you, we have finished the construction, we will go again and then we will monitor again how is the, this special movement going. So we will be able to extract some nice, nice statistics. So I think it will be very interesting. Interesting. How, how long has this project been going on? Is it is it deployed now in Barcelona? So I, uh, we started last year in September, we installed all the cameras and we did all the data gathering and then we ran all the algorithms so, and saved the data. With this, we talked with the municipality. So we like interchanged the data and we saw um, the outputs, if they were what we were expecting or not. Um, and now I think in October, we're gonna go again and do all the same process again, which is installing the cameras and everything. And we will have the new data, and from that uh, we will see what is the new data and also how it relates with the old one. Okay, interesting. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how you architect a system like this um, with okay. what you've done in Barcelona. Okay, so first, um, I think I have the slides. Maybe yes. the second one? No. Okay. okay, so this was the introduction of the project, but there is some context in um, this project. Okay, this is the general architecture. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> um, this is the general architecture of how we do the computer vision algorithms in this in the company. So basically, the first step is the data gathering, which sometimes is more easy, sometimes is more hard because the data is always hard to find, and also you need lots of data for these algorithms. But it's very interesting. Then um, whatever data you have, normally they are videos that we record, or maybe um, that we have. And you do some pre-processing to it so because, of course, you have some algorithms and you, you want to have the best performance as possible. So at the beginning, we always try to do some image processing that sometimes it's just to calibrate the, the color of the images. So all of them have the same tone, which is easy for the, the algorithm to detect the, the objects. We also do like um, some, a lot of the cameras have a fish edge effects. So we distort this, um, well, this distor like we calibrate this distortion as well. So you don't have like weird shapes moving. And then as well, uh, you do some video pre-processing. Uh, pre so basically you do a subsampling of the videos depending on the rate, because um, a lot of the times you don't need as many frames as you think. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Oh, okay. um, sorry. <laughs> um, you normally don't need as many frames as a normal video has, that is like 30 frames per second, but with 15, you're always fine. Then of course you can do some rescaling. You have to encode these videos. And then this is the part of the algorithm. This is the part that I enjoy the most. And in this part is where you decide how are you gonna create this algorithm? What are, you, what are your objectives? So if you want to do object detection, you basically just have to detect the objects and you need to decide which objects are you interested in. And then you can do like semantic segmentation, you can do post estimation, uh, which is very applied in person. You can do face detection, face recognition. Um, so you can do pretty much whatever you want. And then, of course, you do some pre-processing. So you clean the data, you do nice visualization so people are um, so people are able to understand the meaning of all of it. And I think this is in an overview of the workflow of a computer vision project. Are there particular uh, open source projects or libraries or algorithms that you're applying uh, in yeah. this? Yeah, for data. The data gathering that I said is very tricky some, sometimes. And there is a very famous data set that is called the Coco data set, which is an open source, um, well, open source images that you can download. And all of them have labels. That labels is basically that there are some persons that wasted their time putting whatever the object in the image is. So it's very nice for people like us that can use it. And I think we use this for, I would say, almost all of the projects. And then for the algorithms, there's an, a very nice uh, algorithm that is YOLO, that is you only detect once algorithm, which is very good um, coming to object detection because it has like a very nice way to understand images and can work very fast. So we are always like, if we are able to use it, we use a YOLO algorithm and if, uh, you can even find it pre-trained. So you don't even have to waste like a lot of time 
and, and on training and waste a lot of GPUs because you already have like the model working. So you're able to apply it with your data. And then from that, you create an algorithm that um, you can extract the data and play with it. Excellent. And all everything that you're doing in this workflow that you're showing us here that you're doing in the Barcelona project is all on um, recorded video, sort of post-processing. Uh, exactly. It, Correct. Yeah, for now, yeah, for now we're doing everything is recorded, then we have it in the office, we use it, and then yeah, delete it most of the times. Excellent. And uh, you have plans to deploy this work to, to other cities to start doing more processing at the edge. Can you tell us a little bit more about, about that? So, yes. So, we did this project, and it was uh, very successful. But we realized that we have a big problem, which is the scalability. Because um, for this project, we already had some issues uh, with the computers that we needed to run all the algorithms. Because like, of course, when you do the testing, all the data is perfect. But when you start to do the real running for all of the data, everything crashes. The data becomes corrupted magically. <laughs> so <laughs> we had to run a lot uh, to finish in a, uh, this project uh, in the deadline that we had. And we started stalling um, computers from the other person of the office, which they were not so happy about. But at the end, it worked. So we realized that we have a scalability, an scalability problem because um, we plan to have bigger projects. So in this case, we only installed seven cameras, but um, we, are, we want to install more cameras because with, with more cameras, you have more data. And even in some cases, it's very good to have cameras that overlap between them. So you have the images in both the cameras. So from that, you can extract um, data from the distance, and you can see like um, track the persons in bigger spaces. So this is why we realized that we need to do edge detection because in this case in Barcelona, in, you can see we installed seven cameras that they do, do not have overlap between them. So the tracking is just done for each specific camera. Um, but in the future, I think we will kind of change a little bit the architecture of the project, which is going to be very interesting. But well, in here you can see the nice images of or the streets of Barcelona, and as well the object detection algorithm that we applied, which was very nice. Excellent. So how, how does that, um, what does that edge architecture look like? How does that change um, so, kind of the way that you process? So um, in this case, I think you can go to the next slide. So in this case, the issue is that all the videos that we are using, they are saved uh, locally in the cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, because this depends on the um, data privacy that you like the privacy data privacy issues that you talk with the lawyers and they like say you how you have to save this data and use it and um, but in this case we had to save locally the data and then we gather all of this data and take it back to the office implement all the codes and then you have to delete it which is, is very costly so um, in the future we plan to not do it like this because of course, like first you need to have all this equipment in the office to run all these algorithms. And if you have multiple algorithms, multiple projects with multiple cameras, at the end it's kind of crazy the amount of um, GPUs that you have to be to have lying around in your office. Um, and also like it takes space, it's not optimal at, at all. So our idea is that we are going to implement edge detection, which I think is the next slide. Okay. So um, well, here it's a little bit the problems that we have, but. Um, so the idea is that uh, with edge detection, we are able to run the videos in the camera. So because we are already designing our own cameras, because um, in some projects, and not in this specifically, because we could not send the data to the office, but we have some cameras installed in some places in Mexico and as well in, in Riyadh. And both of them um, are cameras that we design, and they are sending us the, back, the data back. So uh, we since we are already designing the cameras, our intention is to um, install also a software in the cameras that is able to run the algorithm and with object detection, or like the whole algorithm that has to do with the images, so object detection and tracking, for instance. So we will run these algorithms with the stream. So at the same time that this is happening, we are running the images. And then the idea will be to only send back to the office the data that is numerical, so big, um, data with the position of the person, what type, well, person or type of object, the time or what, like the colors even of the image, but the idea is to not, not save the data mm -hmm. um, because in this way it's like cheaper for us because we don't need to buy all the storage, all the uh, equipment and as well uh, for data privacy matters is better because nobody's able to see these images, everything is fine, you just obtain numbers. 
So um, in, the, in this, I, I draw a diagram, which more or less how it will be a workflow uh, if you do wedge edge detection. So basically, the first step will be, well, first of all, will be to design the cameras. But imagine you have the cameras that are able, they have a nice um, GPUs inside them that can, uh, can run the algorithms. Also, you need the smaller GPUs because it's just one, like, you don't need the big uh, one to um, run everything. You can let work with specific ones. So you will do install the cameras, set everything that is correct, and then, for instance, you can establish web RTC connection to send all the data to the office, which you are very interested because you need the data. And then you set up the codes for all the algorithms to run, and then you put it on the camera, and this is fine. So you are able to execute the code in Edge. In, for instance, if you are putting this, I don't know if we will put it in the streets because, uh, I don't know, people may steal the cameras, but for instance, in <laughs> a retail store, you can have the cameras, the code is run, is, is run there, the client is perfectly happy because the data is not moved, like you're not sending back images, the clients are happy. Um, and then we have the data, the numerical data here in the office, and from here we can already work, extract, extract meaning from this. We normally create a platform with every project that we do, and in this platform we show all the data in a nice, uh, visually pleasing aesthetic. So we could work with this, create the platforms, and it will be much faster for us as well. And of course, we can do the data cleaning and everything because we already have all the numerical data. Um, so it will be um, a very nice idea that we, well, we're actually implementing it. We don't have like implemented in, we have testing steps now. So we have it in the office, <laughs> but it's and, really nice. And what is the ground truth comparison in the, in oh, the final step there? This one, um, this one is because we did it um, specific for the this project. So normally the algorithms, you test it in, your, in the office and you see the accuracy that you get. But since in this time we were working in, with the municipality, they wanted to know like um, very certainly what is the accuracy of this uh, project of this algorithm? So basically, in this case, the ground truth was basically to compare what a human eye would detect versus the camera. So in this case, in this case, we had the data safe, which, who, which was easy to do. So basically, we had some people in the office that were watching the videos, taking notes or whatever we were detecting in the with the algorithm, and then we compared to both of them. Um, which is uh, very interesting because normally you don't do this specifically, specifically for all the projects that you do. But when you do it, you get very nice results because you then know exactly how this is performing on, and how, like, there are some classes that you're able to detect better, like, for instance, cars, but persons that we move a lot and we all are very different, which is normally a little bit more tricky. So this is basically <laughs> what we did for the project. Yeah, very interesting. How... Um... How, how accurate is, like, the, when you're detecting vehicles, for example, which is easier to detect than a person, like you said, is it important to the type of traffic study that you're doing? And if so, how well are you able to distinguish the types of vehicles that you're seeing? So in this case, it was very important because um, the municipality wanted to make sure that we are, like, using the best software as possible because um, they already have sensors of some of the streets, like ground sensors. So they kind of know the amount of cars. They are also not perfect, but uh, they have a nice estimation. Mm -hmm. So if they want to in implement this project at a big scale, they, they wanted to make sure that we were able to do it fine. And we saw that with, um, for instance, with cars, it, this was the highest accuracy. I think it reached 87. And we were using the algorithm of YOLO 5, which now you can use YOLO 8, which has even more accuracy. Um, but the nice thing about Yellow 5 is that it can go real time, which is also very interesting sometimes. Um, but in this case, cars are easy because cars have a non general shape. They are colorful, they are big, um, so they are good to detect. Persons, in the other way, we move a lot. We like to be in the shadow because in Barcelona it's hot. So <laughs> in summer we're in the shadows. There is a lot of occlusion in the streets because here there is a lot of trees as well. So people tend to move in a weird places. So you are not able to see from the camera. This is also what I mentioned that if you have few cameras, you're not able to see all the context because if you have an object and um, the people is behind the, post, the object, uh, you don't see them. But if you have multiple cameras, you're able to track everyone and in a more exact way. Also the bicycles turn out to be very difficult because of course, the bicycle doesn't go alone. It has a person on top. So depending on the angle, it will detect just as a person and not as a bicycle. Right. You have both of them. <laughs> so this one was the, the most tricky of all, I think. And we had like a 77% of accuracy, which was not bad, but it's 10% less than cars, which 
Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, that's interesting. All right. Well, let's let's take a quick ad break here, and then we're going to come back in just about a minute and do some additional Q and A with Paula and start to talk about how to apply computer vision to some real-time use cases uh, and what the extra challenges may be there. So for those of you watching us live, this is a great time to enter a question into whatever platform you're watching this on, uh, and we will address that after the break. Building custom WebRTC video applications is hard, but your go live doesn't have to be stressful. We thought we were ready to launch our video application, but we discovered it's a lot harder than we thought. Live video applications are not like building other web or mobile apps. Our team worked hard out there today, but we just didn't have all the right pieces. I'll tell you what we should have done. We should have brought in the live video experts from WebRTC Ventures. If you're building a live video application, then trust the experts at WebRTC.Ventures to help you design, build, test, deploy, and manage your custom-built application or integrate live video into your existing application. Contact us today at webrtc.ventures. All right, we're back with Paolo Oses from Numea, uh, talking about computer vision in AI. Uh, so Paolo, just before our ad break there, you were talking about the difficulty of detecting bicycles and, and lower accuracy rate there during vehicles. And I think that's that's really interesting. And, and especially as we start to now talk about how to apply this in a real-time context. And one thing that made me think about when, when you were explaining that was how now, you know, a lot of times if you're riding in an electric car, you'll see a, uh, an LCD panel uh, on the dash. And I've been in some where it's showing, you know, the vehicles around you, right? And obviously that's gonna be important for self-driving cars to have that sort of, be able to do that sort of computer vision accurately in real time. And, um, my own personal experience in, in being in electric cars and watching those is that we're not quite there yet in real time. And sort of one of the funnier examples I remember seeing was being on a interstate highway in the U.S. and seeing a very large like tractor trailer, a large uh, truck um, driving by and the LCD panel. Uh, recognized it as like eight motorcycles in a row. <laughs> so I guess it was picking up like every wheel on this, every tire on this tractor trailer truck and thinking, oh, this is a whole, this is a motorcycle gang uh, driving by me. Uh, when in fact it was a big truck. Now, I guess in either case, you're not going to merge into that. So maybe a self-driving car still would have behaved properly in that situation. But it was certainly humorous to me looking at it and saying, yeah, you know, this technology is amazing, but it's hard too right it's hard to do that in real time uh and it's even with um you know recorded data this is still hard to do with 100 percent accuracy so let's talk a little bit about you know you've talked about doing this with recorded data and then starting to move to the edge where you can um, distribute some of that processing power out to the edge instead of in a centralized location you mentioned that would give us some additional privacy benefits too, which I want to come back to and talk more about the privacy aspect of all of this. But um, what are the additional challenges that you know you would need to do in that edge-based solution in order for it to be truly real time? Or if you know if we were applying AI to this you know video chat conversation that we're in right now to this webinar, the challenges uh, with doing that in real time. So. This is very tricky because um, also like the accuracy that you get in the algorithms also depends on the um, quality of the cameras that you have sometimes. Because when you train the data, normally the, the data that you get is like high definition data. So of course the algorithm is used to have a high definition images, which when you use real time, it's not the best because of course you need um, like to lower the latency. So with uh, if smaller images, you, it's, it, like, it will, everything goes faster. So in this, you have an issue because, of course, you want to play a little bit with it so you can see how low of a definition you can use to get more or less the same accuracy. But you have this kind of game there. And of course, depending on the algorithm, there are algorithms that need to have like multiple process running. In. So it's not the same to do object detection that do object detection and tracking. Because when you do both of them, the algorithm takes a lot of more time. So if you start applying more layers to it, it's more difficult to you to have, to have um, the real time experience. Because for instance, I don't know, um, when you do autonomous driving, you have a lot of things running around. So you have multiple algorithms that are working all at once. 
So it's more tricky to, for you to have it real time than, for instance, if you are just doing object detection. Because at the end, if you're doing object detection and depending on the use case that you're doing, maybe you don't need so high accuracy, but you want to have a general information on what is happening. So for this, you can do like low uh, resolution images, um, just object detection, and you have a lot of data knowing uh, all of the objects, where they are and, and what the, like the position and the time. But depending on how much layers you apply to it, it becomes very tricky. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so that, I hadn't thought about that. That, <clears throat> excuse me, the distinction between object detection and out, uh, object detection and tracking. You mentioned as an example there that yeah. these different algorithms you're going to place some different weight on them of what's important for this use case that we're in. Uh, you know, which one do we value more? Um, so that could vary a lot with with the use case that we're doing. Obviously, okay. Um, we have a question from one of our viewers here. Arno asks, uh, how long does it take for the algorithm to detect and segment the objects? Is this milliseconds or what time length? Yeah, um, if you have the algorithm trained, it's milliseconds, it's very fast. But depends also if you have a lot of objects in the images. Because of course, when you get the image, you will do like all the detections. But when the images are very full, like uh, the computer is a little bit slower to do all the detections if you have like white, image with an object, so it's easier to understand it. Um, so it depends a little bit, but it's very, very fast. It's milliseconds to do the object detection and segmentation. Excellent. So, <clears throat> so that's a, a detection it, once the data is already trained, and obviously the uh, all training you would do prior to uh, implementing yeah, a real-time scenario, of course, based on a large set of data. And so that, that gets me to think about, okay, what uh, well, let's let's talk first about kind of the different use cases we might use this in in more real time. And let's say, um, uh, in particular, I'm thinking about like corporate type of, uh, not necessarily in a in a company or corporation, but let's let's say, where would we want to use these types of algorithms in a video chat type of base use case like this? You know, uh, what what uh, sort of applications do you see there for real time? computer vision and data analytics. So I've been thinking a lot about this because since we had this talk now, I was thinking how there will be cool ways to apply this, uh, well, the, the artificial intelligence. And I think you can use it for a lot of things. For instance, you can use it to understand the emotion of persons. So I, I think I talked with this with Saul, which was the, the person that was here before me. Yes, and yes, from Gen Z, yeah. Yeah, and we we're talking about that you could implement uh, the, the AI algorithm in the video call and do face uh, emo emotion recognition. So with this, you will be able to know in which part of this, uh, this talk people were more interested or were, they were surprised. So you can have like uh, critical points or like uh, important points of this chat. So from that, you can do like a short video with all the important um, faces that this conference had. So for instance, if the people change emotion very quickly, something happened there. So you want to go back and check. So this could be for analysis for yourself or just to have like short videos with like uh, most important mo moments. And as well, you could do it, to, you could use it if you also use a large, large language model, for instance, you can have all the text of this, um, Media conference and this for all these texts you can assign an emotion and with this you could do some training and understand which part of your conferences uh, people is interested in or which parts just people don't pay attention so you can modify your speech and I don't know have like a super wonderful speech that everybody loves to hear um, also I think like with facial recognition you can do so many things in video chats you could um, even um, understand like if you're in a classroom classroom for instance that in COVID we used to do the classes like this. Um, you can track the attendance of the people. So you will do a face recognition algorithm and you understand how, um, who is here and how many times they, how much time they stay in this, <laughs> in this call as well. Um, I don't know, I think you can play a, a lot with it and get some really interesting data, which can yeah. be also used to, for analysis. So for instance, you can be like, if you could see more persons talking like that were here, you could understand if people are paying attention on what we are saying or if they are bored. So you change the topic and you could even do this, this real time. So you understand like, okay, so you can have like indicators. So if it's going up, you keep going with this conversation. If it's going down, you just change it a little bit. Yeah, that's it. That's interesting. So in a, in a, in a, in a webinar type of scenario where you do have live participants, if you're able to, um, 
if if you were able to monitor their their analysis uh, their their sentiment analysis throughout that right now that could come with some privacy implications because at least the way that just popped into my head that would kind of require uh, viewers to sort of have their camera on so we can monitor if they're watching it when they're not actually part of the webinar. So there's privacy issues there to be sure. Classroom setting is pretty interesting one because there's a lot of scenarios there. Certainly there were during the pandemic, but even even potentially more long-term because there are certainly, uh, especially in the corporate setting, there's plenty of educational uh, settings in the corporate setting where participants are still remote, but also in like K-12 and, and you know, younger um, uh, education, uh, school education, where you may want to do this too. Things like um, monitoring classroom, like attendance, like you said, certainly. Um, also exam proctoring is one that I think is yeah. interesting that we, we've seen this come up in before where you want to have a exam given remotely, the students are all going to be remote. And that's a scenario where for the like security, for the integrity of the exam proctoring, you can say to users, hey, you have to have your camera on. That's part of how this tool validates that you're not cheating or whatever. And you could use some real time video analysis there so that, you know, the instructor doesn't have to necessarily watch every student's face if there's 400 people taking this exam the ai can give them some assistance to say this person keeps looking over to the side they keep disappearing out of the screen you know what's what's going on with that user you should go pay some more attention to them right uh and i think it's interesting too to consider like what do you do with those decisions right because like in that example i just gave it may be that maybe the student is turning their head a lot because they're coughing Right. It's not that they're talking to a friend off camera and cheating. They're they're just, you know, they're they're coughing, right? So you don't want to automatically like fail them on the exam or kick them out of the class, right? You're you're using the AI as an assistance to maybe just highlight them to the instructor to say, okay, of these 400 people, go watch this person's in particular for a little bit because something may be off there. But you know, no judgment. Just go look, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I think it's like everyone that is developing AI algorithms will always say like this gives you information, but you are the one that should take the decisions. It's not like the algorithms should uh, go and have a lot of decision making power because they make errors. They, uh, they are, you should not trust it plainly. But for instance, in this case, you could have like an algorithm implemented and the people that are susp suspicious may pop up in your screen. So you got, I don't know, for instance, you have like four people or six people in your screen. And depending on the, the amount of suspicion is that the algorithm is able to obtain, you could have different persons. So it's not like you are like um, the algorithm has any decision, but um, from that you're able to see who may have a chance that is uh, not doing something that is maybe not good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you still have to make the decision. Uh, we, we need to be careful about letting the AI, AI take an action yeah. based on that decision. And you, you mentioned too, um, um, someone at ComCon talking about that contact center customer service type of scenario with conversational AI. It's another, I think another important business use case where this could be used too, right? Uh, the, the same sorts of algorithms. We, I think in, in most cases, certainly in, a, in like a, a phone based call center, there are absolutely companies already starting to use sentiment analysis on the audio of that conversation to detect is the uh, and we've talked about this before on Weber TC Live and, and in our blog too on Weber TC Ventures about using that to detect is the customer, you know, they probably went into the customer service call unhappy, right? Uh, but are is their sentiment improving by the end of it? Are they getting the resolution perhaps that they wanted? Uh, and um, uh, so that's certainly something we can do with audio. Um, in video, we I assume you, you know, you could get more rich information, the same type of idea, right? But something richer because it's not just about the tone of my voice. It's exactly, you know, my eyes, my my facial expressions, right? Yeah, because you can do all the tracking that you want. You can always always have like you can even have um, eye tracking, so you know what the people are moving. So mm -hmm. now I'm looking at you, but if I move, I'm not looking at the camera, so I'm not paying attention. Um, also, the emotion you can get it more like without what well, you can mix. You can even mix the tone and the image, so you have like a more even, full, rich uh, data set, which uh, is is very like 
I think a lot of people is now investigating this part because all of the da this data can be used for a lot of things that can be very good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's interesting too to consider the, uh, the, the use cases that are starting to come out. Like everything we've talked about so far is kind of like passive monitoring in the video chat. Um, but then those scenarios too, where AI can be used real time in the video chat to like, you know, because for instance, I have a dashboard here for a conversation that I have to look over at every now and then, right? To, to or my eyes have to move a little bit to read something, right? Having AI that will actually correct that and sort of, you know, even we all sort of have cameras on our laptop that we may or may not be looking at as we're actually having the conversation. So sort of adjusting the frame of view a little bit so that it looks more like we are looking at each other like we would in person, as opposed to yeah. looking at a part of our screen when the camera may be in a different part of you know the laptop, right? So those are interesting use cases too, uh, where AI can be used in real time. Um, any other use cases in particular that, that you want to discuss or highlight? I think. I think now I don't have more in mind. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So let's go back to the, I want to come back to the, to the privacy part of this mm -hmm. and talk a little bit about that. Um, so in the work that you're doing with traffic monitoring in Barcelona, um, everything would be anonymized, I presume. So even though you're keeping the data, you're not tracking individuals, you're just no, sort of no. tracking aggregate movement on the street. No. You always blur the faces of the persons because you don't want to, to know because it's not it's relevant for you. So it's better to not have this data. You could even add directly when you're recording the data, you can add this. Uh, this there is a, an algorithm that is able to do face detection and blur it. So sometimes okay. you can even put it there. And so the data that you're sending back doesn't have as much sensible data. There is a still sensible data, but you don't have the faces. Um, so in, also in the company, everybody that is able to see the, this data has to sign in a specific paper. So you are able to see the data, but you cannot ex use this data for anything that is bad or even talk. Uh, I don't know if I see someone that I know, I don't know. I don't need to go and tell everyone that this person is famous and it was here. No, like, <laughs> it's not like I saw anybody, but in the case that you see, this it's data that you see, but uh, you don't share it. Um, but the best thing is to not save the data. So when you use the stream, so if you are able to run the algorithms in like record and in the stream run all the algorithms, save this. Like this data is not even saved nowhere because uh, you don't even need to save it. You just directly run the algorithm, then it's gone, nothing happened, and you have the numerical data. And in this way, you don't have any problem with the lawyer because there is no data. <laughs> so <laughs> you're good to go. <laughs> because of course, when it comes to face recognition, well, uh, you have to be careful about it. And I think in Europe, you, we have a lot of laws that are kind of strict in different mm -hmm. parts of, um, so in different countries, it's different. So depending on the, on how they want to approach this topic, but here in Europe, uh, there is a lot of limitations. So it's good. I think we are protected because uh, there is, it is sensible data and you have to be careful about it. And you have to be careful on how do you use it because it's very powerful. Right. So it's a good thing to, to have some limitations on what you can do with it. Absolutely. So what I'm hearing from you is that my idea of setting up a live streaming camera in Miami to see where Lionel Messi is at this point, he, he, I know he got off the plane yesterday, I think, and is there now. But if I want to go meet him at a cafe, you're not going to help me with that. That's yeah, that's too I much. Think, I think it's not a good idea. But you could do a nice training because you have a lot of images of him. So you can. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. Celebrity detection would be an easy algorithm to build. Yeah. <laughs> Probably yes. Absolutely. Uh, now uh, and just uh, one one final note on the architecture. So you talked about um, as as you move to more of an edge computing architecture. Uh, for the work that you do, that that will have some privacy benefits uh, there as well. Can you expand a little bit on that? So yeah, basically it's the thing that if you don't save the data, uh, the data is good. Like you can use it for most things when you don't save the data. If you are saving data using images, is very sensible. And in here you have a lot of limitations. I cannot install cameras in Barcelona and see what is happening. It's <laughs> completely wrong. So right. when you do edge detection, for instance, even the clients don't want this. So if I'm installing cameras in a retail store, maybe they don't want for me to have the access to see what is going on at every time, because maybe they will tell you, no, you need, like, I want the camera open for tracking from 10 to five, when is, that is when there is people in the store. 
I just want this data to run and then delete all the videos. So you run on edge and then save all the data. So numerical data. So you don't know like which employee was here, if I was here or not. Um, because the brand maybe doesn't want to share this information. And also because maybe the, the employees don't need to, I don't know, they don't want to, to make the employees sign something or put this in the table. So it's better that you just use it. You don't even, we don't see the data, they don't see the data. We just run the album and to extract numbers, the numbers and maybe they are like a woman position, I don't know, three, four. So it's not like you can get anything to relate no one to this. Right. So it's, right. Uh, but yeah. Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, rem this reminds me of, um, I was at a uh, healthcare conference earlier this year and one of the demos that I saw was using computer vision to um, monitor um, uh, sanitary policies in the hospital. So for example, they, they would have going into a, I guess maybe an operating room or something, there was a wash station to wash your hands, right? And making sure that every person who went into that room stopped, used the wash station, washed their hands and then went in. And then as they came out, used the wash station again and then left, right? They weren't, uh, at least as I understood it, maybe they could have, but they weren't demonstrating in a way that it was tracking, oh, Aaron didn't wash his hands, you know, put that on Aaron's performance review. It was more trying to detect how well is this, po you know, how well is this policy working? Um, are people using these these stations? You know, what percentage of our staff, you know, doing more aggregate analysis like that? So the technology would probably let you do either one of those things. But you have to be careful, certainly about patients that may be going in there who certainly have not agreed to be tracked in this way. Um, and but even if you know, perhaps your medical staff has been told that they'll be tracked that way through an employment agreement or something like that, you still have to be careful about it. So we have to we always have to keep these things in mind, right? The technology is okay. capable of doing a lot more than we may want to do uh, exactly. in, a, in a positive culture or an ethical uh, consideration. So yeah. Yeah, I had a professor that always said that you have to imagine that which uh, what would what could be able to do a bad person with this data. So right. if it can do um, something that is very harmful, don't do it. Right, right. <laughs> so I think I, I'm a not a bad way. person though, even though I want to track Lionel Messi. Just to be clear, um, uh, that's that's <laughs> yeah, more <really> understandable. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Paula, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward, to, we'll get a chance to speak again at the uh, TAD Summit uh, in Paris coming up in October as part of a panel discussion on the intersection of AI and video there. So we'll be able to continue this conversation. So I'm really pleased to have you joining that plan, panel and uh, really appreciate you taking the time uh, today. Okay, it was amazing. Thank you. It was very fun. <laughs> I Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. All right. Thanks again for uh, all of you joining us. As always, this video will be available on the WebRTC Ventures YouTube channel, as well as on our blog at webrtc.ventures. And if you hang with me for just a few more minutes, we'll be closing today's episode with a short interview with WebRTC Ventures CTO Alberto Gonzalez, uh, who will uh, he and I will talk about uh, some conferences coming up that we'll be participating in. Uh, at uh, as part of the WebRTC Ventures team. Uh, but in terms of WebRTC Live, our next episode will be August 23rd at 12.30 p.m. Eastern. Our guest will be Renan Denser, Engineering Manager at Cloudflare, talking about Cloudflare stream calls their WebRTC implementations. So check that out. That will be a really interesting conversation as well. To find out more about our upcoming episodes, follow us on Twitter or threads now at WebRTC Ventures, Twitch, LinkedIn, YouTube, and join our email list at webrtc.ventures. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. Let's make it live. All right, I'm here with Alberto Gonzalez, our CTO at WebRTC Ventures. Alberto, thanks for joining me today. You were recently at a ComCon in the UK. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Yeah, it was uh, my first experience in person at, at ComCom. It was great. Uh, it was an intimate conference, but with all the right RTC and media experts. So yeah, I learned quite a bit there. And, yeah, it's recommended for, for anyone in the field. Did you have a favorite talk or part of the conference? 
Yeah, um, th there was an interesting project called Saturday that was about um, building like some type of AI bot uh, and used uh, Python for it and was yeah quite interesting. Didn't know about that open source project. In terms of what I like the most of, of the conference, um, it's hard to, to pick one. I uh, like how it was organized, only focus on uh, not only focus on on providing you know technical talks, but also doing like networking activities and things every day, every evening. Um, my preferred was obviously our <laughs> Blackpool trip, um, where we could like all disconnect and and have some some delicious fish and chips meal. Nice, yeah, yeah. We were we were a sponsor of ComCon, and and specifically we were the party sponsor. I think is the term yep. Dan used for the Blackpool event. Um, and uh, I haven't seen you in person yet since that conference. Did you bring me back some of our WebRTC Ventures candy? I have. I have a few. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Hold on. Hold on to a couple for me. Yeah. Uh, uh, in uh, all, all the many years of running this company, we've never made candy with their name on it. So I feel like I have to try it. Um, yeah. All right. Good. Well, yeah, everything I've heard about ComCon is a great event. Uh, so uh, we were proud to sponsor it. Glad you could go and participate. And uh, yeah, I hope, hope to go and participate myself uh, at one in the future. Yeah. There's a lot of other great events coming up this year. We've got a pretty full calendar uh, here in our team at WebRTC Ventures with events that we're attending or sponsoring or speaking at. So let's take just a couple of minutes and uh, tell our viewers about where they can meet up with us the rest of the year. And first one on the calendar here is in a uh, couple of uh, less than two weeks from now, I'll be in New York City at the AWS Summit. Uh, I went to one of these in DC a couple weeks ago. We've got a video up on our YouTube channel about that, a blog post about uh, what I saw there at the DC event. It was mainly around public sector, government type of cloud applications. New York City, uh, you know, have a little more of a FinTech spin on it, uh, but certainly, you know, wide range of industries. Uh, so these summits are free events. So if you're in the New York City area, July 26, definitely recommend you can sign up for free, check that out, uh, learn what's going on with the AWS cloud. I'll be there with representatives of the Amazon Chime SDK team. Alberto, you'll be at uh, an event in Chicago, your your town, uh, KluCon coming up. Tell us a little bit about KluCon. Yeah, so yeah, it will be there, uh, as you can see from August 14 to 17 is the conference and um, it's, it's hosted by the team of FreeSwitch, uh, the open source project. Uh, we attended uh, that conference in the past. I think yeah, we are we are happy this time to be able to sponsor it. And also um, I myself will be talking about uh, bridging WebRTC and SIP. So we'll be talking a bit about my experience with these two technologies and what challenges and solutions we, so, solutions we have implemented in the past. So follow with what we are doing and, and things like that. So hopefully interesting for some of our viewers as well. And yeah, if, if you are interested in attending or will be attending, uh, feel free to ping me directly. Uh, I'm probably most active in, in LinkedIn. Yeah, and ClueCon is another great event, very open source focused, very uh, developer focused in that sense, similar to ComCon. So yeah, if you're in Chicago, definitely check it out and uh, look up Alberto. Uh, in September, I'll be at the Voice and AI 2023 conference in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is a, a conference I went to last year. It was just called the Voice Conference last year. They rebranded as Voice and AI now. Um, and um, it was a really good event. I just got to attend one day of it last year, but uh, got to meet a lot of the vendors in the conversational AI space, saw our partners from Vonage there. Um, and... Uh, so looking forward to attending the full event this year, learning more about that. Certainly conversational AI uh, overlaps a lot with the work that we do in WebRTC and video applications and certainly call center, contact center type of applications. There's a lot of overlap there. So looking forward to uh, learning more, networking with people there. And if you're going to be in D.C. in September, please give me a shout. Love to meet up with you there. Alberto, in October, you'll be back, uh, well, still in Chicago. Uh, yep. You live in Chicago, so great that there's some really good conferences there for you to attend. Tell us about the IIT conference. Yep, so this one is one that we have 
been involved since like I think five six years ago. So we yeah at least, uh, we're yeah. pretty active <laughs> in in this one. Uh, we will be happily sponsoring as well, and this time I will be also chairing the the WebRTC track of this uh, IIT RTC IEEE conference. <laughs> there is a new <laughs> um, the addition now that we need to add the IEEE because they are also part of the sponsoring team of of this conference. And and yeah, it's it just a conference with many uh, uh, years of history. Uh, it's one of the first that started to talk about WebRTC. And uh, every year we have big players in the WebRTC field attending. Um, if you are interested in presenting or we are uh, we are currently calling for, for speakers and we will close submissions probably at the end of the month. So yeah, um, if if you want to talk, yeah, ping me and and we can discuss topics or, or you can submit your talk directly. Excellent. And there will also be a hackathon the weekend prior that yep. our colleague yep. Hamza is uh, uh, organizing, correct? Yeah. Yeah, there will be a hackathon. Um, is our first hackathon uh, purely part of the RTC conference. Um, we already have some cool sponsors um, ready, and I think it, it will be real fun to, to have this, this hackathon with part of students from the school at IIT, but also like it's open to anyone. So um, also if you are interested, um, you can reach the, the website of the IIT RTC conference. Uh, we have a blog post talking about it uh, in webrtc.ventures if you are interested. Excellent. And then rounding out the year in October, I'll be in Paris for TAD Summit. These are the TAD Hack and TAD Summit events at Alan Quayle, who we've, we've had on as a guest on Weber TC Live before, and we've participated in these events in the past. It was uh, TAD Summit was in Portugal last year. Uh, really enjoyed attending that last year uh, and speaking at it. So looking forward to this year's in Paris. Uh, we're putting together uh, the sessions now, but I'm expecting to do a presentation on uh, maintenance and deployment of communication applications of WebRTC apps. Uh, that's definitely a hot topic for us at WebRTC Ventures right now, doing um, production DevOps and support and maintenance for our clients as WebRTC applications continue to mature and scale to larger levels and you know bigger and bigger companies adopting this as part of the normal workflow. That type of support and ongoing production maintenance is a really important topic. And so we'll be sharing some of our experiences with that. Uh, in the presentation at TAT Summit. And I'll also be moderating a panel discussion on the intersection of AI and video. Uh, looking forward to um, uh, having some really great guests on that panel talking about their real world experience using AI in the audio and video aspects of communication applications. So that'll be uh, tadsummit.com, Paris, uh, October 19th and 20th. And then finally, the last big conference I'm attending this year is the AWS reInvent. Uh, I was at it last year as well. Obviously, a huge conference in Las Vegas last week of November. Uh, but since we are APN members and uh, Amazon Chime SDK system integration partners, uh, we'll be uh, attending there and uh, happy to meet with you and talk with you about, about those applications that we build. And obviously, we'll be learning a lot, too, about what's coming up next in the AWS cloud. So, Alberto, uh, we'll, uh, you and I be hitting the road a lot this year. So lots of great events. Again, I uh, appreciate you uh, doing the travel uh, for some of these. Oh, oh, well, a lot of them right there in Chicago. So at least hopping on the train. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I, had, um, I had some travels for, for the previous one. That's um, right. You made yeah. up for it going to the UK uh, for ComCon. But uh, yeah, we'll uh, uh, love to see any of our viewers there uh, at any of these events. Just reach out to us, team at Weber TC Ventures, or you can find either one of us on LinkedIn. Uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for your time, Alberto. And uh, thanks to all of you for watching Weber TC Live today. Hope to see you at one of these events. Let's make it live. Thanks for joining us for WebRTC Live. Visit our website at webrtc.ventures to learn more about our custom design and development services and to learn more about upcoming episodes of WebRTC Live.